For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and giving thanks, broke and said, Take ye and eat. This is my body, which shall be delivered for you. This do for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you shall drink for the commemoration of me. Or it's taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. During the mad rush to compose and enact the new liturgy of the Novus Ordo Mise, the committee charged with the task of replacing the most ancient, essentially unchanged mass ritual in the church with a new revolutionary ritual, reached a new level of notoriety, even infamy, when it began to compose new Eucharistic prayers, including Eucharistic prayer number two. While riots, protests, and revolution were happening in all the streets and universities around the Western world in 1968-69, the Latin Rite was experiencing its own upheaval. The Roman canon, the Roman canon which historical texts tell us was and is the liturgy of St. Peter himself, was simply one of many options. But why the mad rush? to change the liturgy. Well, speed is of the essence when it comes to revolution. Revolutionaries, including liturgical ones, know that that window of opportunity is open for only a short time before a counter-reaction happens where people begin to come to their senses and attempt to stop the revolution. The initial drafts of Eucharistic prayer number two, it is said, were so bad, so theologically dangerous, that the text had to be rewritten in a hurry. And at the last minute, during a late night meeting by two men in a Roman restaurant, liturgy done in a cafe, in other words. The two men were the famous convert, Father Louis Bouillet, as well as Benedictine liturgist named Father Bernard Bott. They were under a deadline. By the next morning, they had to produce some text that could salvage Eucharistic prayer number two. And so at a small circular table in what is called a trattoria, or an Italian version of a fast food restaurant, the two men with pens in their hand and cocktail napkins as their writing pad completed the task before the deadline. While St. Peter the first and greatest Roman pontiff had prayerfully and carefully composed the Roman canon using a stylus and heavy vellum parchment, Eucharistic prayer number two was composed quickly and matter-of-factly using big pens and a disposable towel. Can there be anything more insulting to liturgical tradition and the venerable Roman rite than that? And yet that event happened, witnessed and written of by Father Louis Bouillet. It happened in a cafe some 54 years ago, and it's also instructive to us. It tells us just how shallow, how impoverished, how unworthy of the Roman church is the new liturgy. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, now the retired and emeritus bishop of Rome, once observed the following about the Novus Ordo Mise. Many of us have heard this quotation. Although acknowledging the validity, and yes, the power of the Novus Ordo Mise to bring about the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, Cardinal Ratzinger noted the problems in connection with the development of the new ritual surrounding the most blessed sacrament. 
Tata Ratzinger wrote the following, quote, What happened after the council, liturgically speaking, was something else entirely than the fruit of development. In place of liturgy, as the fruit of development, came a fabricated liturgy. We abandoned the organic living process of growth and development over centuries and replaced it as in a manufacturing process with the fabrication of banal on-the-spot product, unquote. In short, it was a careless, artificial liturgy by committee, a committee process, again, unworthy of the Church of Rome. Even good Paul VI admitted that such liturgical changes would cause upset, he said this, that it would impoverish the official liturgy of the Roman Church. The Pope stated that he was instituting, quote, a new rite of the Mass, he stated, a change, he wrote, in a venerable tradition that has gone on for centuries. This is something that affects our hereditary religious patrimony which seemed to enjoy the privilege of being untouchable and settled. We must prepare, he observes, for this many-sided inconvenience. It is the kind of upset, he states, caused by every novelty that breaks into our habits, unquote. The words of the Holy Father truly pointed to a disruption that would happen in the worship of the Roman Church due to the liturgical revolution. Now, earlier this week, Holy Monday to be exact, the liturgy included a gospel passage recounting our Lord's visit, his final visit to Bethany before his passion and death to see his good friends, to see Saints Lazarus, Martha, and Mary Magdalene and is being anointed by the latter. The historical and inerrant gospel states that, quote, Mary Magdalene, therefore, took a pound of ointment of great price and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of ointment, unquote. What an extraordinary scene. Such devotional extravagance, piety, reverence, and love expressed by the penitent woman Mary Magdalene. The ointment was called nard, sometimes called spikenard. It came from the spikenard plant native to India's eastern Himalayas, growing in the ground somewhere near the level of 15,000 feet in elevation. And the roots of this spikenard plant were crushed and they were distilled into an intensely aromatic amber-colored oil that was a favorite perfume in ancient days. This best spikenard, and that's what was used, the best spikenard was imported from India in sealed alabaster containers. It was most expensive because of the tedious extraction process, as well as the cost of importing it along the extensive caravan routes leading to the Mediterranean. The gospel clearly puts the price at some 300 denarii, or 300 days wages, making it perhaps as much as $50,000 in U.S. currency. Yet the penitent... Mary Magdalene literally breaks it open. She pours it all out, liberally, upon our dearest Lord in preparation for his passion and burial. Because when it comes to our Lord, we can never be too generous. Never. Then the Holy Gospel makes mention of one apostle. One apostle who found this prodigality, this splurging, to be objectionable. Yes, Judas. Judas, a perfect example of today's virtue signaler. The scriptures read the following. Then one of his disciples, Judas, 
Judas Iscariot, he that was about to betray him, said, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Yes, the virtue signaler, the pearl clutcher, the moralistic moralizer objects. And yet the gospel tells us the real reasons for his objections. Now he said this, the Bible records, not because he cared for the poor, they never do, but because he was a thief. And having the purse, the common purse, he carried the things that were put therein, unquote. But our dearest Lord defends Mary Magdalene. He defends extravagance. He defends extravagance due to the fact that nothing should be spared when it comes to the Most High God. Nothing spared. Jesus therefore said, Let her alone, that she may keep it against the day of my burial, connected to his very sacrifice and death and burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you have not always, unquote. It's interesting that this event, our Lord visiting Bethany, is just a few days before our dearest Lord institutes the most blessed sacrament and the holy priesthood. Just days before Holy Thursday and the Last Supper, which is remembered, represented, and renewed on this very night. And that same body, anointed by Mary Magdalene with such abundance, that same body is truly, substantially, and corporally present upon our altar. And like St. Mary Magdalene, the church has feared no extravagance, devoting the best of her resources to expressing her wonder and adoration before the unsurpassable gift of the Holy Eucharist. In preparation for the first Mass and the first ordinations on Holy Thursday, our Lord asked some of his disciples to what? Prepare properly a place for this event. And so the church throughout history has prepared a proper setting with proper dignified instruments for the sacrifice of sacrifices. When it comes to the most blessed sacrament, when it comes to the church building, the architecture, the altar, the sacred vessels, the vestments, the linens, the statuary, the iconography, there is, as we say in Latin, numquam satis, never enough, never enough beauty, never enough richness and decor, not when it comes to God. The greatest artistic works ever created by men the greatest statues, the greatest paintings, the greatest windows, the greatest architectural structures, the greatest music were all developed purely for the sake of the Eucharistic Lord, for the Mass. How dare then we skimp when it comes to Holy Mass and the Holy Sacraments? That's why I'm always appreciative to our good assistant, pastor and his work to make our parish church truly look like a temple of God should look. And for the good brother who organized this liturgy during the Triduum, for the ministers, even the straw ministers, we appreciate. And of course, all the brothers, the servers, the good choir, the people who clean this church regularly, the people who adorn even the outside, the landscaping that surrounds this church. You all enrich the liturgy, and thus you increase the extrinsic glory of God. That's what creation is supposed to do. And yet, there's always Judases. Always Judases within Holy Church. Those who splurge on themselves and their comforts and yet are always sparing and tight when it comes to our Lord. I'm sure that some will virtue signal as boasting about their involvement in all these social justice programs 
For the disadvantaged, it's interesting that society is more than willing to erect gigantic and astronomically priced football stadiums for the good of men. The new football stadium in Las Vegas came in at $2 billion. The new football stadium in Los Angeles, where the Super Bowl was played, came in at $6 billion to build. And even in economically hurting Buffalo, there is plans for a $1.5 billion stadium. It's in the works. Many, even within the church, are penny pinchers when it comes to Christ the King. And so we see cheap church buildings, concrete monstrosities, tin-sided buildings. We see polyester vestments and cheap linens. We see unattractive artwork, hootenanny music, butcher block table altars, undignified sanctuaries. And the plain, pedestrian, ordinary setting for the unbloody sacrifice of the Mass leads to immodest, informal, and inappropriate dress and behaviors. What's the big deal? It's not a special place. Oh, but there's always enough funds, when you think of it, for cushion pews in some places. Always enough funds for the helping of the backsides of men. Plenty of funds for HVAC comfort zone systems and for microphones. <laughs> so the words of wisdom coming forth from the human minister might be heard. But you know, it's not just the physical, liturgical setting and the material instruments used at church. It's also about the ritual. That's the most important garment of all. The liturgical ritual that surrounds the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist. As the sacred vestments of the priest, the deacon, and subdeacons are important since the ministers put on Christ. So the garments of the words, the gestures, the rubrics of the liturgy clothe the sacrament of the altar. It's very important. A poor, impoverished ritual may not affect the validity of the sacrament or even its power efficaciousness objectively, but it may not dispose the participant to benefit greatly from his participation the richness, the grandeur, the complexities of the prayers, the gestures, the movements of the traditional Latin Mass surpasses, far surpasses, that of the Novus Ordo Mise, which purposely sought to make the liturgy supposedly more accessible to modern men who appreciated, we are told, a more down-to-earth, pedestrian experience in Holy Mass and this jettisoning of our liturgical inheritance, which is something of priceless worth, the loss of our very patrimony as Latin Rite Catholics was done, we are told, for the sake of man. That was the purpose. Read the introductory documents. It was done for the sake of man, for the sake of the apostolate, for the sake of filling up churches with countless modern people. Well, how did this liturgical experiment, and it was an experiment, how did it work? Judging from the number of church closings over the last few decades, we can clearly, empirically say it didn't work. It was a failure. In conclusion, Cardinal Ratzinger made this observation back in the 1980s. There are words that he wrote. I'm just quoting them. He writes, The pastoral benefits that so many idealists had hoped the new liturgy would bring did not materialize. Our churches emptied in spite of the new liturgy or because of it. Unquote. 
He then adds, and the faithful continue to fall away from the church in droves. Cardinal Ratzinger concluded by saying, in the end, and these are damning words, in the end, we will all have to recognize that the new liturgical forms, well-intentioned as they may have been at the beginning, did not provide the people with bread, but with stones, unquote. Consider also, recently, what the former superior of a traditional Latin Mass community recently stated. The priest put it bluntly. The Novus Ordo rituals are concocted. They are, quote, a populism of bad taste and are, quote, unworthy of the Church of Rome. It is high time that the Mass of the Ages returns to the entire Latin rite. Save the liturgy, save the world, as they say. And it is time to abandon, once and for all, the new liturgy. For as we can see from empirical evidence, it has clearly failed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.